What Young Men Want. It's Christmas Eve, and I'm on my way to deliver some bottles of moonshine. Now, it's not me who makes the moonshine, but I have a source that's a well-kept secret. Top-grade stuff that elevates your mood and facilitates the sharing of song and story, and that doesn't leave you with a sore head or a bad stomach in the morning. But I'm not permitted to reveal the secret of the maker's identity. So, if you ask me who made the moonshine, I would have to give you the same answer that my father gave to the Mountie who stopped him on a back road with half a bottle of moonshine in the seat beside and the rest inside him. The Mounties had been looking for the moonshiner, and this Mountie thought he had a good chance to get a lead. He said, tell you what, I'll let you go if you tell me who made the moonshine. And my father says, how do I know you'll let me go? And the Mountie says, I give you my word as a gentleman. I'll let you go if you tell me who made the moonshine. On your word as a gentleman? Okay, it's a bargain, my father said to the Mountie. Well, God made the sunshine, and he made the moonshine, too. Blessed be his name, and good night to you, sir. And then he walked away. So anyway, that's how I learned discretion. And that's why I have a nice supply of the good stuff. I bring it to my neighbors, because the McDonald men like to have it on hand. And I like to do what I can for them. When we moved into this house, near where the four brothers live, we didn't expect to be welcomed in the way we have. Donald plows the lane after the snow. Jimmy watches out for my daughters as they wait for the school bus. And Malcolm helps, helped us fix the pump and install electrical outlets in our old house. So when I can, I bring them moonshine. Not that they plan to drink it. You see, the McDonald's are soft-hearted fellows and they have lots of friends and some of those friends like to go for a drink or ten. And so, there are the occasional Sunday morning visits, knocks on the door, and fellows with shaky hands and aching heads asking for a little drink. And although none of them takes a drink now, there was a time when they were the champions. They know the value of a little drink of moonshine to make a fellow feel better with his lot in life and to smooth over disagreements. So that's where the moonshine is needed, and I'm happy to oblige. The thing is, the McDonald men used to be the wild ones. I hear lots of stories about those days from the neighbors, told with varying degrees of rueful envy and admiration or amused disapproval. All of them were happy and hard, hard workers. They worked in the hard rock mines and made big money for themselves and bought fancy muscle cars with lots of chrome and bright colored paint and drove them like a bastard. So they eventually learned the lesson that everyone learns at some point or other. Fast cars and booze don't make the best combination. On the way, there were quite a few smashed up rigs. That's where Archie Crash got his name. What happened in the end was that Malcolm was working in Northern Ontario and Jimmy was working in the same mine on the opposite shift. Jimmy's on his way home from work one early morning when he comes to a roadblock. The police were stopping traffic and clearing up the remains of a very bad car crash and he watched from his car as the attendants in those days of an all-purpose vehicle that could take you to the hospital or to the morgue. He heard the policeman say, it won't be long, they're loading him in the back of the wagon. This guy didn't make it. Then Jimmy caught a glimpse of the crumpled wreck that had been such a source of pride and joy, that turquoise blue he'd recognize anywhere. So he jumped out of the car and ran towards the barricade. The policeman tried to stop him, but Jimmy was small and quick, and he dodged and kept on running, and as he ran towards the crumpled wreck, he saw them carrying a stretcher, and on the stretcher was a figure covered with a sheet, and the sheet pulled up over the face. Who's under the sheet? The driver said, it's the poor f who's in that car, and he's gone. Jimmy pulled the sheet down and looked at the face underneath. Malcolm, Malcolm, and there was a flicker of an eyelid. Jimmy turned to the driver and said, that's my brother and he's alive. You better get him to the hospital, quick. So that was how Malcolm ended up alive, even if he did have to spend six months in the hospital and end up with a crooked arm, which looked bad but worked pretty well. And it wasn't long after that that he moved home and married Louise and built a house near his parents. And that's when Doll and Jimmy made their way back too.
So Malcolm got a job with Nova Scotia Power as a lineman, and he managed fine, even with his crooked arm climbing power poles. That was in the days when you had to hike a mile or so in the deep woods to where the poles were among the trees. And even then they were coated with ice and steel, and all you had was spikes on your shoes and a belt. So when he retired, his legs were pretty much gone and his knees were frigged, and he wears those cut-down rubber boots that you slip your feet into without having to unlace them. But he still knows all about electricity, and he sat in our kitchen chair and gave directions while my husband wired the outlets to the old house. So, it's Christmas Eve, and I always take a little present down to McDonald Men. I had three quarts of moonshine in my bag, one for each of them. And because it was such a beautiful night, just a little bit of snow on the grass, enough to make the full moon enough to make the full moon light up the field, I took the shortcut down along the shore. Years ago, when I was a child, growing up four miles along the coast, I loved to swim in the sea and watch the sun shining and sparkling on the waves. But in the nighttime, when the windows toward the shore were opened, I could hear the mumbling of the waves upon the stones. I always felt uneasy, as if someone was there in the shadows. But I'm a grown woman, and all that seems silly now. When Malcolm tells my daughters about the uh, ghosts that haunted these shores, I reassure them that it was only old stories and they have nothing to worry about. And he tells them how the animals talk on Christmas Eve, because a night when many things are possible and strange things can happen. On this Christmas Eve, the moon was very big and white in the sky, and I looked out across the bay at the expanse of the Northumberland Strait, and I was thinking about the old days, when men like the McDonald's didn't go away to the mines in northern Ontario's in fast cars. No, in those days, boys and young men who wanted adventure signed up on board a sailing ship. All along this western shore were the little harbors where boats were built. There were people who came from the treeless, windswept islands of Scotland and brought with them their affinity for the sea. Many were skilled boat builders and sailors, and landing here, they must have been awed to see acres of big trees there for the taking, standing timber just ready to be made into boats, and tall trees for the mast. And so that's what they did. And where there are boats being built, there's need for crew. From right here in the beach, they left for the whaling grounds, with shares in the catch and the chance of a big payoff, or off to the Grand Banks, or the Boston trade. And where there's need for a crew and the chance for adventure and the thought of gold coins jingling in the mind of young boys and men, there were runaways. So I've heard lots of stories of young men of this village going to sea and never being seen again. And then as if my mind had conjured it up, I saw light against the dark horizon and was drawing closer and I could see the bright outline clear against the sky. It was something I'd heard of, but never believed in. It was the ghost ship. The story says that the ghost ship sails the Northumberland Strait and no one knows its name or where it comes from, only that it sails on moonlit nights and burns with a red-orange flame. I saw flames licking up the tall mast and lighting each line of rigging. The flames outlined the shape of a schooner. I saw the flames along the deck and the masts engulfed in flame. Even the ropes were on fire, and they outlined in perfect triangles the shapes of sails. The ship moved before the wind, scooting across the surface of the water. And I wondered about those on board, about one simple misstep with spark or light or smoke that caused a fire on board a wooden ship cocked with very flammable pine tar. And what about those on board? They had the short choice of being burned alive or jumping into the water among the sharks and the frigid depths and the currents too strong to swim against. And as I watched the burning ship, I felt the first lapping of the incoming tide against my shoes and I looked down at the curling white foam that floated on the top, and it seemed as if it had a shape. And then the shape took on the form of a skeletal hand, and the form emerged from the wave and took a firm grip on my ankle, a grip 
that was cold and strong, strong as a vice, and it chilled me to the bone. And as the wave receded, it pulled me toward the inky depths of the sea. I stumbled and fell clumsily into the sand, and I could feel the wave dragging me out. I could feel the grasp upon my ankle holding me tight, and I stretched my shoulders back on the sand and grabbed at a big hunk of driftwood that lay on the beach. It was the trunk of a large tree, half embedded in the coarse sand, with its roots extending in all directions, and I grabbed onto one of them and held as tight as I could. I was lying full length on the beach, my head towards the shore and my feet in the waves, and the force of that grip dragging me towards the water. To get a better grip, I lay my head in the sand and wrapped my arms around the sharp and craggy roots. With my cheek pressed against the sand, I saw broken fragments of wood, and they were so close that I could see they were fragments of lobster traps. Not the metal kind they use these days, but old, old ones made of hand-carved lengths of wood and now thrown up from the depths by the breakers. As the tip of the way eddied around the side of my head, my left ear was immersed in the seawater, and when the first trickle reached my eardrum, I began to hear voices. Come, girlie, come and join us. Come, girl, we have nice things for you. Oh, but we're lonely here. We're lonely here and we need a woman. There are so many of us and so few women. We need you here, girl. We need you here with us. And then the voices began to sing and I heard many languages, Gaelic and English and French, and I heard Portuguese and what may have been the Basque tongue. There were a hundred voices murmuring there, and I could feel the cold grip on my ankle grow harder, and the waves as they rushed out, pulling me towards the depths. But I held on, thanking God for the white weight training I've been doing on Thursday nights, and I was glad to be wearing my thick gloves so I could grip the rough wood. I could feel the lumps of bottles in my backpack, wrapped in a couple of dish towels. And then I thought about the McDonald men and how they kept bottles on hand for a social lubricant and tonic, and how a hospitable drink is a fix for a multitude of ills. I tried to reach around back, but I couldn't let go of the tree trunk, so I extended my fingers until I could reach the top buckle of the strap, and I unbuckled it to open across my shoulder, and then I rolled so the bag was beside me, propped up against the trunk. And then still holding onto the root with both hands, I pushed my chin against the bottle and held it firm against the trunk and reached down with the tips of my fingers, unscrewed the top of the bottle from the very best overproof moonshine. And then I pushed my shoulder against it and inched it from the sand. And when the next wave rolled in, I dipped it up so that clear liquid that was 90% alcohol, glug, 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 out of the neck of the bottle and into the wave. And then I heard the voices murmuring and rising in surprise and delight. Oh, well, what's this? Give us some of that now. Ooh, that's a fine brew. And I could hear the wave rolling a little bit. There now, boys, I said, how about a drink? And I could feel the grip loosen just a little bit on my ankle. So the second bottle was easier to lift, and I unscrewed the top, and with shaking hands, I trickled it into the next wave and watched the thin stream of liquid lit by moonshine pouring onto the shining stones. And quickly then the third. This one was harder because the bag was loose and empty now and flopping over, but the grip in my ankle was not so painful nor so tight. I managed to the end, and this time I waved the bottle around as I poured in the poured it in, in order to distribute this Christmas cheer as fairly as possible. Then, with three empty bottles lying on the shingle gravel and rolling a little in the ebb and flow of the waves, I heard the voices getting softer, and the singing turned to crooning, and the voices turned to mumbling, just the mumbling of the waves upon the shore. And I pulled my ankle free and slipped out of the thing's grasp, and watched the white foam dissolving away. I was able to scramble up and stood myself behind the barricade of the big tree trunk and watched as the last glimmer of light and the burning ship disappeared into the black horizon. 
My clothes and hair were dripping wet and embedded with wet sand. There was sand down my pants. Reminded me of the time. Oh, but never mind about that. My feet were chilled to the bone, and my ankle ached with a pain that made it hard to walk. But the murmuring voices of the waves were now softer and calmer. Only the, mu the moon lit the sky, and all around was restful night. And that is why on every Christmas Eve I go for a solitary walk along the shore and bring with me my old backpack and a couple of bottles of the best moonshine and pour it out into the sea. <laughs>